Please welcome to the podium the Assistant Administrator for Fisheries at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Eileen Sobeck. Thank you, everyone, and welcome back. Um, ladies and gentlemen, or as President Tong so aptly said, friends of the ocean, um, I'd like to introduce our first panel and get, off our, get our substantive discussion off um, to a start today. Uh, this is the panel that where we are going to be discussing sustainable fisheries. And our speakers today will be Dr. Ray Hilborn from the University of Washington, whose presentation was prepared jointly with Dr. Boris Worm um, of Dalhousie University, uh, Dr. Victor Restrepo, Susan Jackson of the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation, Dr. Hoyt Beck Peckham of Smartfish, and Minister Peter Sinan of the Republic of Seychelles. Um, as we just heard this morning from Secretary Kerry, sustainable fisheries are vital to maintaining healthy ocean ecosystems as well as for job and ensuring global food security. Our panelists will discuss the current status and trends of global fish stocks, identify problems and challenges to maintaining sustainable fisheries, including overfishing, illegal fishing, and bycatch of non-targeted species. We will also hear about some innovative projects designed to tackle these challenges that provide uh, possible models for broader um, solutions that can be applied elsewhere. Our first presenter this morning is Dr. Ray Hilborn, professor of the School of Aquaculture and Fisheries Science, University of Washington, who specializes in natural resource management. His co-author on this presentation is Dr. Boris Worm of Dalhousie University, who could not be with us in person today, but is joining us online. Dr. Hilborn will set the stage by presenting the status, trends, and prospects for global fisheries. I'd like to thank Secretary Kerry and Assistant Administrator Sobek for the opportunity to uh, make this presentation. I have to figure out the slides to see if this works. Okay. Um, there's been a divergence of the uh, perspectives on the status of, of fisheries, but in 2007, Boris Worm and I put together a group of scientists to assemble data and see if we could come to agreement. Uh, we were able to come to agreement, and this talk summarizes what we've learned and we would say is a now a general consensus that was reached among the vast majority of the scientific community. Uh, this consensus was possible because of observations on the status of fish stocks, that is, data that have been collected. And our key, key conclusion has been that the status of fish stocks and trends is very different in different places. So in this presentation, I'll update you on, this, on the status and trends in fisheries and talk a bit about the management priorities and solutions. 
But first, a little bit of uh, background is, uh, is required to, on the subject of overfishing. And essentially, overfishing is caused by too much fishing pressure. That is continuously taking too high a portion of the population or the community of fish. The major symptom of overfishing is low population size. So to produce long-term maximum sustainable yield, there is a level of fishing pressure that we want to see and a resulting stock size that we expect. Uh, and to produce food from the oceans, and I believe that's the first time food has been mentioned so far today, we want to be in that range. Now in the US, we have a classification system uh, where we distinguish between overfishing, which is too much fishing pressure, there on the y-axis, and uh, overfished, which means there is too few fish, which is a measure of stock size. Now, and I will present data both on the abundance of fish and their uh, fishing pressure relative to those levels that produce maximum sustained yield. The food, whoops. I think we've gone one, there we go, okay. Uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations produces a report every few years on the status of fish stocks and breaks stocks into three categories. Underexploited, here shown in blue, fully exploited, shown in green, and overexploited, shown in red. The percentage underexploited has continuously declined since about 1970. Uh, while the percentage overfished was increasing up to 2008 and may have stabilized since then at roughly 30%. While many view the decline of underexploited stocks as a concern, this is in fact a necessary step to produce food from the oceans. Now this has occurred during a period when fishing effort, shown in red, has been rising but catches globally have stabilized. This means that the same number of fish are being caught despite increasing energy and fishing effort. Now we can split the stocks of the world into two groups, based both, or actually four groups, based on their size and whether or not they are formally assessed and actually managed. Uh, in general, assessed stocks tend to be better managed and on average appear to be at about the level that produces long-term maximum sustainable yield and on average appear to be stable. Unassessed stocks, however, are often unmanaged and therefore more depleted and many such stocks appear to be due in, in, in decline. And these unassessed and unmanaged stocks account for roughly two-thirds of the global catch. Uh, and our understanding of these stocks is much poorer than our understanding of the status of the assessed stocks. Interestingly enough, there is a strong, just a second, let's go to the, okay. There is a strong uh, relationship between the status of fish stocks and their size. Uh, the large fish stocks appear on average to be in good shape, that is, all the fish stocks whose average catch is on the order of 10,000 tons or higher, which is about 90% of the world's fish stocks, appear to on average be at the level that produces maximum sustained yield, um, while the smaller stocks appear to be in poor shape. We believe this is because large fish stocks receive more management attention. Uh, small fish stocks are typically unmanaged, and they're also inherently more vulnerable because they tend to have smaller range and lower abundance. Uh, the status depends on the taxonomy and the location of the fisheries, and of particular note is that uh, some taxonomic groups, particularly sharks, skates, and rays, appear to be in particularly bad shape and of, of extreme concern. Our best knowledge is from scientific assessments which are performed on about 500 fish stocks around the world, constituting about 35% of global stocks, global catch. Uh, such assessed stocks are heavily biased towards developed countries, with Africa and South Asia having very few stocks that are assessed. In this graph, 
The size of the circle represents the total catch reported to FAO, and that the proportion in green is how much of the stocks are in assessments that we have access to. And what we'll see is that we know much, much less about stocks in South Asia and Africa. Now I'm going to move into some complicated figures that show the uh, regional trends and exploitation rates in different regions of the world. Uh, in general, most developed countries have been reducing fishing pressure, which you can see as a decline in those lines, uh, over the last decade. This emphasizes that we actually do know how to manage fish stocks if we apply the tools in our toolkit. And some areas, as you will look, you can see uh, Alaska and New Zealand have never really been subject to any significant overfishing pressure, while other areas shaded in red have seen significant overfishing. And if we look in detail, here's the U.S. West Coast. That horizontal line is the level of fishing pressure that would produce long-term maximum sustainable yield. And you see that it never actually exceeded that level. And in the West Coast of the U.S., we're now hardly fishing our stocks at all. In fact, uh, we, we harvest for the bottom fish about 1% a year. Uh, in contrast, the European Union has typically been fishing well above the level that would produce maximum sustained yield, but has made significant progress in the last decade in reducing fishing pressure down towards that horizontal line. We can do a similar graph where we look at the biomass of stocks. And again, there are major differences in fish biomass in different regions. So if we look in detail at the U.S. East Coast, now you want to be at or above the horizontal line, because we're now talking biomass. And you see the US East Coast, while subject to overfishing, and many stocks overfished, has been rebuilding biomass so that, they're, that on average, they're almost now back to the level that produces maximum sustained yield. In contrast, the Atlantic Ocean tuna fisheries were largely um, uh, in very, very large abundance back around 1970 and have been declining and in the recent years have typically gone below the level that produces maximum sustained yield. Okay. Now let me just briefly talk about management priorities. Next slide. Uh, biodiversity loss is of particular concern in tropical regions that house most marine species. These regions often have low management effectiveness and rapidly increasing catch, in some places fueled by foreign fleets. This makes them an urgent conservation concern in these hot spots. Bycatch is also is the unintentional catch. Whoops, uh, let's catch up with the bycatch. Uh, oh, these are all, sorry, didn't, uh, one more. Uh, bycatch uh, is the unintentional catch of non-target species and is difficult to estimate at a global scale because it often goes unreported. When bycatch is actively managed, it can be reduced dramatically. However, in most of the world, there is little bycatch measurement or management. And finally, in conclusion, fisheries are at a global crossroads. While management has been effective in some areas, overfishing remains a primary concern in most jurisdictions. Rebuilding is a global priority and hot spots in the global south need urgent attention, and bycatch is a major problem that needs to be addressed comprehensively. Thanks very much. Dr. Hoyt, thank you so much for that excellent short summary of the state of uh, global fishery science. Um, so next we will hear from Dr. Victor Restrepo. Dr. Restrepo currently serves as a fisheries expert for the United Nations World Ocean Assessment, the Scientific Advisory Committee of the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation, um, and the Marine Stewardship Council. He is going to discuss some of the challenges we face on the path to ensuring sustainable fisheries. Dr. Strepa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Today, I will speak about three of the main problems that are uh, facing some, many of the fisheries in the world. These are overfishing, illegal fishing, and bycatch. And these problems have already been mentioned by uh, 
our previous speaker and earlier this morning. The first problem I want to talk about is overfishing. Um, overfishing results sometimes in dramatic stock collapses, causing massive losses in jobs and food production. But in less severe cases, uh, like Dr. Hilborn was explaining, it simply results in wasted potential benefits because the fish stocks are not utilized in an optimum way as they should be. The problem of overfishing is very similar to what happens in the exploitation of many other renewable natural resources, like in forestry, for example. When there is open access to a resource, demand for the product and good profits attract more and more users, and this becomes a sort of a vicious circle until simply there are too many users for the size of the fish stock that is being exploited. This is what is known as the tragedy of the commons and is common, like I said, to many of the uh, open access resources. One of the main drivers of overfishing is overcapacity. Simply put, overcapacity is having too many vessels to exploit too few fish. Under open access, fishing increases until profits disappear, catches are taken with higher costs than are needed, and eventually catches diminish due to the reduction in fish size. Overcapacity, once it exists, is very difficult to get rid of. It takes a long time to disappear because there is a huge capital investment uh, in some of these fisheries. Endemic overcapacity in fisheries leads to overfishing and wasted resources. The second problem I'd like to highlight is illegal fishing, or IUU fishing, which stands for illegal, unreported, and unregulated. The main cause for IUU fishing is the lack of effective governance in some places, which bad players take advantage of to make quick profits. There is a, clear, a very clear relationship between lack of effective management and enforcement in some regions and the amount of IUU fishing in that region. The lack of effective governance is most evident at the level of the flag state, that is the country where the vessel, where the fishing vessel is registered. But there are also other weak points in the market states and in the port states. And IUU fishers make a living preying on these weaknesses. IUU fishing is very difficult to quantify, but available studies estimate that it can represent up to 50% of the catch in some fisheries. IUU fishing undermines fisheries management, especially for stocks that are under a rebuilding plan to end overfishing. And the sacrifices of good fishers to rebuild these overfished stocks are eroded by IUU fishers. The third and last problem I want to mention is bycatch. Bycatch is a considerable threat for some of the most sensitive species in the ocean such as turtles, seabirds, marine mammals, and some species of sharks. Their unwanted losses in fishing operations can be sometimes much greater than those from natural causes or from other influences such as habitat loss. Bycatch magnitude depends greatly on the type of fishing gear that is used. In some cases, discards in fisheries can be as much as 60% of the landed catch. In general, fisheries are managed to be highly selective for one species or one uh, site range, but this is not always possible depending on the fishing gear. In most fishing operations, a variety of species are taken. But bycatch also has another problem, and that is waste. Many discarded species could help satisfy some of the world's food security needs. But this is not always simple to do because fishers are not keen to use part of their fish wells, their storage space, to store unwanted fish that will not give them any profits. But there is a need clearly then to balance bycatch mitigation, that is reducing the amount of bycatch that the fisheries generate with utilizing that bycatch that can be utilized for food security purposes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we've had an overview of the science and we've had an overview of some of the uh, dire problems facing um, the road to sustainable fisheries. Um, 
And as, Senator Kerry, as Secretary Kerry said uh, this morning, we know what we need to do, and it is not beyond our capacity to address these problems. And so um, our next few speakers are going to um, provide us some inspiration on, on some, some solutions that can lead to sustainable fisheries and some concrete examples of their own experience, within their own experience. Our next speaker is Susan Jackson, who is currently the president of the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation. She will present on an innovative and novel partnership in the Pacific Ocean among tuna vessels, processors, foundations, and states that utilizes technology to enhance transparency, transparency and promote sustainability. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, everyone. ISSF is a global coalition of scientists, the tuna industry, and WWF. We are committed to science-based initiatives for the long-term conservation and sustainable use of tuna stocks, reducing bycatch, and promoting ecosystem health. While we're engaged in a number of projects to support efforts by regional fisheries management bodies, their member countries, and the fishing industry to maintain the sustainability of tuna fisheries around the world. Our overall approach is one where science informs policy. Stakeholders reach out to policymakers, and the private sector uses market influence to incentivize good behavior. All stakeholders have a necessary and important role to play in developing and implementing effective fisheries management. One project that I'm going to talk about today is improving the quality, availability, and timeliness of data to support effective fisheries management. You've heard Dr. Hilburn and Dr. Restrepo talk about the problem of overfishing. In order to address overfishing, you need good science, and you can't have good science without good data. Too often, data used to monitor stocks is out of date, incomplete, inaccurate, or in a form or format that's unusable by scientists in a practical sense. You also can't have effective fisheries management without enforcement of management measures, and you can't have effective enforcement without timely, reliable data. We're trying to address these, correct these data gaps by working with scientists, governments, and fishing fleets to get the data right from the boat, both from the vessel captain and the observer, to a usable database within days or weeks, rather than months or years, and in a standard format without the need for manual entry. For the Pacific region, where much of our work is occurring, tuna is the most significant natural resource, providing communities there with long-term food security, jobs, and economic development. Partnerships with scientists, foundations, the fishing industry are opportunities for countries to build the tools and capacities we all need to sustainably manage these resources. The project I want to highlight today is a collaboration with the Secretary of the Pacific Community, the scientists in the region, various governments in the region, or those whose vessels are fishing in the region, ISSF and other funders. Participating states include the Federated States of Micronesia, the Solomon Islands, American Samoa, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, the United States, Philippines, and Fiji. Now on every fishing trip, two types of data should be submitted to the scientists and managers fishing logbooks, or the captain's log, and observer reports. Well, too often, reports with critical data sit in boxes on the floor because the resources aren't available to enter the information into the relevant databases. In some cases, the data are months to years late in being submitted, and in some cases, unfortunately, they aren't submitted at all. The key element of this project is the development of an electronic logbook, which is called the eTuna log. The electronic logbook allows the captains to enter the data on their computer or tablet device and transmit it directly to a database at the Secretary of the Pacific Community and elsewhere, where it's fully integrated almost immediately. Now, this might sound pretty basic in this day and age, but from a fisheries perspective, where the norm is for handwritten captain's logbooks to be entered manually, usually after a long delay, it's a groundbreaking advancement. For purse seine vessels, this project is currently being trialed in the Solomon Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, New Zealand, and United States. The regional tuna bases are already beginning to receive the information, and other countries have expressed interest in joining. Now, for longline vessels, the technology is still in development, but countries are also beginning to stand up and volunteer for the trials. And work is also underway for similar systems for electronic completion and submission of observer reports. 
Transparency, technology, traceability, three elements of fisheries management that are important not only to science and governments, but all parts of the supply chain, from processors to retailers, and increasingly the ultimate consumer. But it all starts with gathering data in the right way. And we believe the results of these efforts will be a quantum leap in terms of the timeliness, accuracy, and availability of the data that the scientists need to assess the state of the resources. Public-private partnerships is certainly a trendy phrase that we've been hearing more and more about in the conservation discussion. But they do work. We've seen them work. They are here to stay. And they're certainly the lifeblood of what we do at ISSF. Partnerships like this one in the Pacific will lead to the development of critical fisheries management tools, not just in the world's largest tuna fishery, but in every fishery. Thank you. Next, we'd like to welcome Dr. Hoyt Peckham, who is the founding director of SmartFish, a social enterprise based in La Paz, Mexico, that incentivizes more sustainable artisanal fishing. fishing. He will discuss his firsthand experiences addressing sea turtle bycatch in Japan, Mexico, and Hawaii through participatory research. Welcome. Thank you all. It's truly a, a pleasure. Secretary Kerry, Drs. Hilborn, and Restrepo all explained the problem of bycatch. I have the, the pleasure of talking about some solutions to it. But I'm going to start with a little bit more of the problem because therein lies the solution. Bycatch is costly for fishermen who, oh, sorry, I jumped the gun there. Bycatch is costly for fishermen who lose time and money dealing with it. Uh, think of the fishermen on the stern of this boat who after 24 hours of fishing has a net full of turtles he can't sell and none of the dorado he was after. Bycatch is also costly for governments who are obligated or which are obligated to minimize it. And these high costs have a silver lining. Fishermen, governments, and conservationists all have a strong common interest in reducing bycatch. Fortunately, bycatch can be mitigated and in many cases avoided altogether. We can achieve this through participatory research, partnering fishermen with other experts to derive solutions for fisheries that are prosperous and bycatch free. North Pacific loggerhead turtles are endangered, nest exclusively in Japan, and migrate across the entire North Pacific basin. During these astonishing migrations, they suffer bycatch in Japanese pound nets, Hawaiian longlines, and Mexican gill nets, among other fisheries. I'll use the loggerhead in these three fisheries to illustrate how we can solve bycatch across very different economic and regulatory conditions. In the past, many loggerheads were caught by the Hawaii Longline fleet. But in the late 90s, compelled by the US government, fishermen worked with engineers and scientists and solved how to catch swordfish and tuna without catching loggerheads. In Northwest Mexico, we needed to craft bycatch solutions profitably enough that fishermen would voluntarily adopt them. So we partnered fishermen with scientists, and together we figured out how to reduce bycatch by changing gear, improving quality, and differentiating their catch in the marketplace. We've built the social enterprise SmartFish around this opportunity to incentivize not just bycatch reduction, but also to increase overall fisheries sustainability. There are thousands of pound nets in Japanese waters, and some of them are massive, about six times the volume of this large auditorium, just the trap, costing over $2 million each net. Hundreds of endangered loggerheads drown in this gear each year. So to figure out how to retain fish while letting only turtles escape, we built a model of a pound net trap inside the, Suma, the, blue, the blue water tank of Suma Aqualife Park. We invited fishermen, managers, engineers, and scientists from Japan, Mexico, and Hawaii to design what we call uh, turtle escape hatches. Please roll the video. These hatches you can see in the, in the trap roof. Oh, yeah, in the trap roof on the upper left corner there. Obviously, that's a much smaller trap than is usually used. We ran dozens of scientific trials loading turtles and fish into the trap. 
and then we wait it. Turtles can hold their breath for a long time. But after a while, they need to breathe, just like us. After 10 minutes, they get desperate to breathe. And people begin to worry. Unlike turtles in typical pound nets, eventually, they found the escape hatch, these ones in our trials, and their way to the surface to breathe. And amazingly, when they escaped, all the stakeholders present cheered, even the most skeptical and disinterested, and there were many. This was a transformational research experience, I think because everyone identified with, identified with the turtle stuck in the trap because deep down we all fear drowning. But this is the really beautiful part. Stakeholders who were denying that pound net bycatch even occurs were suddenly arguing passionately over who had the best or what was the best hatch design, how to build it, how to fund that transition. Many of them got down on their hands and knees to improve the designs personally. I'm very happy to share that we began testing the hatches commercially just last week. My take home for you all, fisheries can be maintained and even improved while avoiding bycatch. It's not always cheap or easy, but it's definitely possible. I'd be happy to put you in, sorry, there are experts collaborating to solve bycatch around the world. I'd be happy to put you in touch if you aren't already and to share any details on what I've presented today. Thank you very much. Well done. Our, um, we, are, we are very fortunate today to have as our final solution speaker, Minister Peter Sinan. He is the Minister of Natural Resources for the Republic of Seychelles. And he would tell us about a unique multilateral initiative to fight IUU fishing in the Indian Ocean. Minister? Thank you. And distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, members of the press. I come from the Republic of Seychelles, as was said. It is situated in the southwest Indian Ocean between four degrees and six degrees south of the equator. We have an exclusive economic zone of 1.4 million square kilometers of the Indian Ocean. And Seychelles is strategically loca located bang in the middle of the tuna migratory route that makes Port Victoria the most important tuna lending and transshipment port in the Indian Ocean. It is also host to one of the largest tuna canning factories in the region, producing 1.6 million cans of tuna per day. The never-ending chase for what we call our blue gold, our tuna, is an intensive activity that has catapulted the industrial fisheries activity as the second most important sector and income earner of our blue or oceanic economy of the Seychelles. Unfortunately, not all operators in our vast ocean are legitimate. Illegal, unreported, and unregulated fish, fishing continues to pose us with one of the, our greatest challenges. The Seychelles is, a very, is the very first African country to sign and ratify the FAO port state measures to deter, prevent, and eliminate IUU. To date, only 10 states have accomplished this feat, and 25 states is needed for the Port State Measure Agreement to become effective. Faced with the challenge of ever increasing IUU fishing, that was in part the pretext for a lucrative business of piracy in the Indian Ocean, seven countries in the Indian Ocean has grouped together with the key stakeholders, such as the Pew Charitable Trust, to form the Fish Eye Project in close collaboration with the NEPAD Stop Illegal Fishing Program of the African Union. This short the short documentary that will follow will inform how the Fish Eye is walking the talk to put a stop to illegal fishing in our part of the world so that a legitimate, monitored, regulated and sustainable business model rules the day in the Indian Ocean. The Seychelles people and the peoples of the seven countries that banded together is one of the, high, the, Seychelles, one of the highest per capita 
consumers of fish. At home, it is more than just part of our diet. Consuming fish is a way of life. It's an islander culture, a tradition, and a heritage that we want to pass on intact to the next generation. Growing up, when me and my siblings used to complain of having too much fish in our week, weekly diet, our mom would always respond with the following. Eat fish. Fish will give you brains. Brains will earn you money. And money, money will buy you more fish. For this to be a reality, there must always be fish in our oceans. And it is projects like the fish eye that will ensure that this be the case for generations to come. Thank you. Illegal fishing has brought a lot of disastrous effects in that food security has been threatened, employment, revenue to the governments, and the general marine environmental destruction. These guys do not see fish as a food stuff of feeding people. They see it as a trading commodity, like any other commodity, be it gold, be it logs, be it diamonds. And the more they make out of it, the more greedy they become. Having patrol vessels or asset is a big problem or constraints for many developing countries. They have declared, they have claimed huge areas, huge EZ, but they have no assets to monitor those EZ. With the fish eye, we have been able to track in real time illegal fishing. In Southeast Africa, seven countries have formed a partnership called Fish Eye to fight large scale illegal fishing, a crime that is robbing poor countries of a valuable natural resource with no regard for the ocean environment. Satellite tracks show that the Premier was fishing in the mid Atlantic through 2011 and 2012 including in the Liberian zone, Liberia waters, uh, where there was a moratorium on fishing at that time. There was no industrial fishing allowed in Liberia. And this was clearly illegal. From the, uh, the network Fishai, we got the information that actually that vessel, Premier, was heading towards uh, our port. When the vessel came to our port, we inspect the vessel, we uh, got the documents uh, that they had on board, and we had enough uh, information to deny the vessel uh, access to unload in our port. Then the immediate thing that, that we did was to inform all of the members in the Fish Eye project that the vessel had come to our port so that they can look out for the vessel in the event that it tries to do the same in, in their port. Well, Fish Eye is a new model for protecting offshore resources uh, around the globe. Uh, it, it proves if you share information between countries and then consider it as a whole, you can act more effectively against illegal activity. It makes it more difficult for a vessel to use red tape or slip away between international boundaries. And for me, fish eye is definitely stopping illegal fish entering the market. The new elements about fish eye is that before we were talking the talk, we were acting individually, but it was like we were all shooting in the dark. We were not seeing, we were not knowing, we were not in the know of the whole picture. Now the illegal fisher would play one against the other, would move from port to port and be clean at one port and be an illegal fisher at the other. This is not anymore possible, acceptable and we have acted upon that. Um, thank you very much. I want to thank all of our panelists for their presentations, which have highlighted uh, the considerable challenges we face in maintaining sustainable fisheries and have demonstrated that there are some successful examples of how we can meet these challenges and, and address them around the world. Um, 
Now we're going to move to the interactive um, portion of our program, and we're going to open the floor to those of you in the room uh, and to our online audience to, for questions, comments, and a discussion, a conversation, hopefully among us in the room, the panelists if you wish, and those online. If you wish, wish to answer, to ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand. We have runners with microphones. If you are online, please pose your question via Twitter with the hashtag our Oceans 2014, all one word. Um, and I know we have um, groups watching this program via live feed to several US embassies. And so I want to uh, welcome those who are watching in Mexico City, Guatemala City, uh, Tegucigalpa, Managua, and Panama City, and invite you to join in the discussion as well. So let's begin. Um, I understand we have um, an announcement from someone in our audience, from um, Andrew O'Brien, special rep representative for Global Partnership in the Secretary's Office of Global Partnerships, and Mark Kaplan, founder and CEO of Tone. Uh, is Mr. O'Brien here? Would he like to start? No, then I will turn it over to, oh, I'm yes, right yes, sir, sorry. Yes, dark okay. yeah, dark out there. Beside. I have a brief role. Welcome. I, I wore, thank you very much. I wore my blue lobster tie in honor of the uh, occasion. My role is brief. It's to introduce uh, Mark Kaplan, who is the founder and CEO of Tone. And uh, we have an exciting public-private partnership uh, that Mark's going to talk about. And uh, it's about using mobile applications to make uh, fishing more sustainable and to improve the lives of people who fish and the communities they live in. It's all you, Mark. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew, and, and thanks, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, when, we, when we were introduced to this program, we looked at this from the point of view of a fisherman. And, and, you know, we were introduced to a lot of different mobile applications that other organizations were doing. And I thought to myself, how many apps are a fisherman going to use? And then if you look at it in terms of accessing this data, how much is this going to cost a fisherman? And we looked at what's the value exchange going to be because we're asking these people to do things that are outside of the, their day-to-day -day life. So what we looked at is to try and make the experience easier. So what we did with Tone is... We consolidated these historically fragmented applications and provide the uh, single user experience to a fisherman with unlimited access to the data, as you can see up on the screen. And then the, the next challenge was, how are we going to bring this into the market and actually reach fishers in a responsible way? So the first step was to really invest in the tools that are going to improve their life and their trade. So what we did is we, we were working with mobile networks around the world to package up what we're calling an activation kit that will in essence be a waterproof bag that will include a, a lower end smartphone um, and a data plan. We will then provide that to uh, government contractors to engage fisheries and provide them with free management tools and onward to the fishers to get, again, unlimited access. But what's very exciting about this is by providing it to them directly, we're able to save them about half of their cost on basic mobile communications, which if you look at the ICT price bucket in, in some countries can amount to about 15% of their monthly income. So it can make a, a significant difference in the lives of a fisherman. And in, in our equity partnership with the GSM Association, we're able to reach over 800 carriers in 200 countries. So the scalability of this is immense. And as you can see from the map up above, we're going to be launching this in Indonesia, Philippines, and Sri Lanka. And there are several other countries whose carriers are already committed. And, and beyond there, we'll be able to, um, to scale to the rest of the world. So thank you very much. Great, very interesting. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we have one, one other announcement. Um, we're honored to have Rear Admiral Jonathan White, oceanographer and navigator of the Navy, here to make an announcement. Admiral? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Secretary Kerry, several people have talked about enforcement of illegal fishing activities. Great video that was just shown talks about some of the efforts to get after enforcement through detection or knowing what's happening and using information from surveillance. One successful model of doing that that we can all identify is dealing with speeding automobiles in and around Washington, D.C. We have cameras. 
which sends you nice little messages and bills in the mail. We have radar, and then we even have airborne sensors out on the highways around here that network together to ensure you pay the penalty to enforce the laws. For illegal fishing, the U.S. Navy, through the Office of Naval Research on Naval Air Systems Command, in partnership with the Air Force Research Laboratory and with the U.S. Pacific Command in Hawaii, is working with the government of Palau and the Palau Marine Law Enforcement to network surveillance sensors, shore-based, sea-based, and air-based, to provide that single surveillance picture of illegal fishing activities to enable detection and enforcement. This is one small project, but in a very important project. We're doing a pilot this summer in and around Palau, one small path to the enforcement and reduction of illegal fishing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral. Okay, hashtag our ocean 2014, but um, I don't know if we have any tweets yet, but otherwise, does anybody in the room have any comments, questions? Yes, ma'am. Let's see, let's get you in a, um, a microphone. Does somebody have a microphone? Right back here. Here, we're trying to reach right here in the very front. Maybe we can pass the microphone up. <laughs> um, how many of those turtle rescuing nets have been um, used for rescuing turtles? Wait. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Is it, that were, uh, They've, we've tested them in three sets of trials over a couple of years. They haven't been implemented uh, commercially, but we're testing them commercially for the first time starting last week. So a very exciting progress. Uh, it's a big uh, leap to get them implemented industry-wide, but we think there's great promise because of all the stakeholders who have been involved in developing them. Fishermen in the United States use um, um, another kind of device called a TED, a turtle excluder device to exclude turtles from their nets. And we have one of those in the courtyard. So make sure you take a look at that um, during the breaks. Thank you for your question. Questions, announcements? Dr. Earl. Oh, God. Yeah. Thank you. So for the panel, the question about other values for fish and other ocean wildlife that are taken, extracted, as commodities. Um, there has been a pattern over the years with respect to our consumption of wildlife on land, <clears throat> land and in the sea, whether it's trees that we value primarily as board feet of lumber, but have come to see other values that should also be on the balance sheet, or whales once valued primarily just as oil or bone or meat, now a real understanding of ecological and economic values that should be on the balance sheet. Do you see a time, or is this the time, to consider the other values other than just looking at fish or lobsters or whatever lives in the ocean for values as ecological values, as tourism values, for carbon cycle, for the whole way that the oceans influence the health of the ocean beyond just extraction for a small amount of, of um, what actually feeds people on the order of less than 2% of the food that feed, feeds the world comes from ocean wildlife. Anybody on the panel care to respond or take a crack at that? Minister? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. That is very, very interesting question. Definitely, the time has come. The President of the Republic of Seychelles have started since January a summit that will continue every January in the margins of Sustainability Week in uh, United Arab Emirates to promote the blue economy. Basically, the concept of the blue economy is for us to look at the way that we treat our oceans and the natural resources therein. We, we have been extracting 
for food and otherwise in the oceans, but we have not really looked at certain values that the, my, my, the lady has just talked about. The other values that the oceans and its natural resources provide us apart from what we extract to sell or to throw away as discards. I think uh, the blue economy, today we are looking at our oceans. There's been conferences and, and, and ma many conferences recently about the oceans and concerns. Definitely the time has come for us to take notice of the va other values that the oceans provide us and we have so far taken not a notice of them and they have not, as she has said, appeared def on the balance sheets that we, 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 all, we, we, we all look at. I think uh, the time has come and this conference is part of that, that trend that is emerging for us to take cognizance of the values of our oceans. I come, my country is 455 square kilometers. Our ocean is 1.4 million square kilometers. Now, you, we, we are called a small island developing state. We are a huge country. If we take the whole boundaries of our EZ and practice sustainable development on every inch of what we have to, we have to take care of. So I would invite everybody else, um, every, folks online, to also respond to Dr. Earl and give their views of this issue so that we can have a, mm -hmm. a conversation. Dr. Hoyt, uh, sh a short response? Sure. Um, I think, you know, in, in, since about the 19, 1990, the, the main focus in fisheries management has been to stop overfishing, rebuild fish stocks. And in the countries that have been successful at that, we're now facing this this challenge is what is our balance between utilization and, uh, and other values. And, uh, you know, in the U.S., we've got growing number of marine protected areas. We've got reason, ca quite cautious fishies, fishing, fishing management for most stocks that it takes us well below the level of produced maximum sustained yield. But other countries that may get 50 percent of their animal protein uh, from fisheries will probably make different choices, but we're just we're sort of getting to the point where we can start to, as a society, make make those choices. Um, in the past, solving overfishing was, was a win-win. You were going to get more food, and you were going to get a more natural ecosystem. And now we're getting to harder questions in some places. Great. Well, speaking of questions, we have um, a question from um, the embassy in uh, Nicaragua from the folks who are viewing us there. Uh, and I don't know the answer to this question, so presumably somebody in the audience does. How can, how can fishery um, regulators in other countries access ocean buoy data? So we'll try to find the answer to that question and, and get it back to, um, to the folks in Managua. Uh, did, was there a question here? We have a microphone over here. And if you don't mind identifying yourself and and stating your, your comment. It doesn't have to be a question. Where comments are welcome okay. or answers. My name is Roberto Valcanti. Uh, I'm the National Secretary for Biodiversity in the Brazilian Ministry of the Environment. And I'm also co-chair of the National Fisheries Management Committee that issues the regulations for fisheries in the country. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate the US government and uh, Secretary Kerry under Secretary Catherine Novelli for this, uh, organizing this extremely well attended and well regarded conference and the speakers are excellent. And uh, my main comment is, uh, Secretary Kerry mentioned the, the issue of not being out there, not enforcers out there and there are not people out there looking at what's happening. Most countries do have people out there, but uh, fisheries management is typically a multi-agency coordination effort, and uh, often the national navies, the enforcement agents out there don't have a unified mandate. On the contrary, the uh, fishers and everyone that operates in the system have very little clarity on what, what are the rules, and the rules keep changing all the time, and particularly, and as the panelists mentioned here, there is a tremendous lack of data. Uh, uh, and I thought that was only the case in Brazil, and as you may have seen in one of the presentations for Brazil, I think there's a very high 
uncertainty. But speaking to colleagues in, in Canada last year at the conference, they said, look, the problem that we have here is it's very expensive to collect the data. Uh, one of their fisheries uh, boats that they use, not a very large one, costs $30,000 a day to operate. So when I looked at that, it was obvious that uh, for any country, the effort to collect data will always be very substantial. So my questions to the panel are actually three questions. One is, um, uh, are there mechanisms for improving multi-agency uh, collaboration in fisheries regulation so that whoever is out there on behalf of the governments has a, a, a clearer mandate and an easier way of uh, passing information. Uh, secondly, in Brazil and in many other countries, there's a big po policy question, and that one is, uh, should we encourage aquaculture, manage uh, wild fisheries, or what combination of those? That's a question. And uh, the third comment, I'd like to say that uh, there's a, a large amount of scientific cooperation amongst countries, and particularly for Brazil, cooperating with NOAA has been extremely important in the cetacean management. Brazil has 54 cetacean species. It's forbidden, as you know, in Brazil to any lethal activity on cetaceans, but bycatch and many other issues are very big. So um, what can be done amongst countries to improve uh, the scientific basis of uh, fisheries management. Thank you. Great, thank you for, for three excellent questions. And I think you provided um, actually some solutions that should be useful collaborating among our governments um, on cetacean research. Um, and I think Minister um, Sinan provided some examples of, of cooperation um, uh, in the Indian Ocean. Does anybody have any other examples or want to speak to, to any of those questions? Or does anybody in the audience? Any other, any other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Oh. Oh, go, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't see. It's, it's very hard to see out there. It was handed to me, so I thought I'd Absolutely. speak. Um, I'm, I'm um, directing my question to Dr. Restrepo, who I couldn't help but notice uh, seemingly has broad experience in Colombia. And my question is twofold. What is the resolve that you have down there, both political resolve and uh, constituency resolve, to go forward with meaningful programs uh, that parallel uh, uh, conservation uh, or ocean protections? And given uh, the fact that Colombia may not be indicative of other uh, countries, do you think that the uh, use of uh, force uh, against countries that fail to agree with common uh, standards of conduct should be encouraged or discouraged? Thank you for, for your question. Yeah. I am a native of Colombia, but I do not work uh, in, uh, regularly in Colombian fisheries field. Uh, I am familiar with the resolve of Colombia in tuna fisheries by in recent years having joined the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission and its resolve to become more directly engaged in the management of tuna fisheries in the, in the Pacific Ocean for the Colombian participation. Uh, I understand that this afternoon one of the panelists is from the Colombian government and I would welcome you to direct that uh, policy question to her. Great, thank you. I have one over here and then a couple over here. So, yes. Uh, so, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Adalberto Vieira. I'm the Deputy Minister for Marine Research, Republic of Cape Verde. We are also an ocean country like Seychelles. <laughs> and I would like to say that uh, having uh, more than 700,000 square kilometers of economic exclusive zone, Cape Verde always face uh, global challenges concerning the fishing sector. They used to say that the fish does not know borders. A Cape Verdean fish today is a Nigerian fish tomorrow, and after tomorrow it's a South African fish. Oh. So uh, global problems, global challenges uh, deserve global approach. And I 
we thank the United States, the Secretary uh, Kerry and uh, Madam Under Secretary for giving us the opportunity to be here and to address this issue, to have the opportunity to know what is being done in other countries. You, you should not uh, try to reinvent the wheel, we should try to perfect the wheel. And for a country like Cape Verde, with lack of financial resource, we are always trying to see what other countries are doing so we can uh, learn with that and we can perfect it and try to put it, that in place in our reality. But I have a question, Madam. Uh, for uh, countries like Cape Verde, Highland countries, lack of financial resource, big economic exclusive zone, there is a need of uh, a specific approach. So what can we do on a global perspective in order to take into consideration that? In Cape Verde, we support the port state measures. We are uh, uh, putting in place several measures to fight IUU fishing. We are buying new vessels. We are trying to set partnership with other countries. But we do know that it's a continuous work. It's a continuous job that needs continuous res resource. And uh, uh, how can we do on a global prospect to address this kind of issues, the problem that the small countries has? It's not the same thing to, uh, for a country, an island country, to patrol its waters. It's not the same thing like a, a mainland country. It's a complete different thing. It's more difficult. It requires more resource. It requires a new approach. Well, 10 islands. In each island, we shall have an approach. Thank you. Thank you very much for those um, observations and, and your question. Um, I'm not sure that we have um, answers. We've, we've talked about some of the solutions about public-private partnerships, um, and there have also government-to-government -government partnerships, and we've had some illustrations of those today. We have time for one more question. Hi. Um, I'm with the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, and really appreciate being here oh, and very much appreciate uh, that the United States, along with New Zealand, has been trying to create one of the world's biggest marine protected areas in the Southern Oceans by Antarctica, as while well, we're also trying to get East Antarctica and other marine protected areas created. What I'm interested in hearing is we talked a bit about how marine protected areas are an effective uh, way, tool for creating sustainable fisheries, but we also talked about no-take zones. And so I'm, I'm particularly interested for us to have a conversation about at what point a marine protected area needs to have a significant size and a significant no-take zone for it to be a real marine protected area. Anybody want to respond to that on our panel very quickly? Um, otherwise, I think it might be the topic of um, another session tomorrow afternoon. And um, uh, I know we had a great announcement um, from uh, <coughs> President Tong of uh, Kiribati today. I'll Okay, I'll, short, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that, short response. that um, large marine protected areas, large ones, are probably a negative asset towards fisheries yields because the more, more of the ocean you close, the more the effort gets moved to other places, and there's a very uh, serious lack of information on the relationship between size of marine protected areas and fisheries yields. And the place they appear to have the most benefits to fisheries is when fisheries are very poorly managed. When fisheries are well managed, there's very little uh, yield benefit to marine protected areas. Um, I'll probably get booed out of the room for that, but uh, that seems to be the data. Well, we're here to have a conversation, and so all perspectives are welcome. Um, I think we've, we've come to the um, end of our opportunity to have questions. I'm going to do a minute or two of wrap-up here. But I really encourage everybody to keep talking over the course of these two days. We're all going to be here, um, and so I want to keep the conversation going. Um, thank you all for your questions, your thoughts, and for contributing to this interesting discussion. During this session, we've heard how overfishing continues to be a significant problem in many parts of the world, and that it can be exacerbated by IUU fishing. We've also focused on the adverse impacts not, um, not only on target stocks, but on non-target species caused um, in the form of unwanted bycatch, the impacts of which can be quite severe and um, are not well known in many cases. Uh, we've heard that these problems tend to be particularly acute in areas where um, the, the data of fish stocks is least available and which leaves many stocks without any effective management. Our panelists have highlighted the need for more accurate and timely data in order to better assess these stocks to establish effective management regimes um, and to ensure compliance with those measures. 
And we've heard about some important initiatives designed to collect, collect and transmit data in a timely, more effective, least, more efficient, le less expensive way to support scientists who conduct this important work. With respect to bycatch, we've heard when actively managed, bycatch can be significantly reduced. And we've seen one concrete example of how this can be achieved. And another, as I mentioned, will be on display in the courtyard, a TED. Um, but we've also heard that bycatch management is not actually um, a focus yet in many fisheries and that we have to um, get some more attention paid to this issue. And finally, we've heard how IUU fishing undermines national and regional management regimes and adversely affects the status of fish stocks, the livelihood of honest fishermen, and the food security for those who depend on fish for a significant source of dietary protein, most of whom are in the least developed parts of the world. There are a lot of other factors um, that we haven't been able to touch on. Um, I'm sure that um, we'll touch on them in our discussions, including issues um, that were mentioned by Secretary Kerry regarding subsidies that contribute to overfishing and overcapacity. So I want to leave you with one thought. Um, as, as Secretary Kerry said this morning, the health of the ocean is a vital security issue, and it's essential for, for maintaining the environment in which we all live. We very much hope that one of the outcomes of this conference will be increased attention to this issue, not only by fisheries managers, scientists, and fishermen who already know how important these issues are, but that these issues will receive greater attention as part of the global for foreign policy agenda in an effort to generate the political will necessary to address them in a serious way. Um, again, as Secretary Kerry said this morning, we know what need we need to do, and it is not beyond our capacity to do it. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, to help identify which lunch you are attending, please take a moment to look at the sticker color on your credential. The instructions on the screens will assist in guiding you to your lunch. Our next session begins at 2.45.